Hello and welcome to Praxis. I'm Bronwyn Adcock. I'd like to welcome our live audience in Sydney, those watching from the Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea and Timor-Leste, and of course our panellists, who I'll introduce to you shortly. Our topic today is how do we spend our aid dollar effectively, and it's a crucial question. Not just because the Australian government is expected to dramatically increase the amount it spends on development aid, but because the lives of millions of people around the world depend on getting this right. While it's perhaps easy to be overwhelmed by the enormity of the challenges facing the world today, there have been significant improvements in the lives of many of the world's poorest, and aid has been a major contributing factor. In our region, for example, polio has been eradicated in the Pacific. In Papua New Guinea, 1.5 million children have been immunised against polio and measles. And worldwide, the number of people living in poverty has fallen from 1.8 billion to 1.3 billion. But over a billion people are still living in absolute poverty today, with economic volatility and the impacts of climate change adding to the existing challenges. There's clearly still much to be done. Worldwide, there's increasing scrutiny of how aid money is spent, and a global discussion is underway about how to best help those in need. To work through some of these issues, I'll turn to our panel now. We have joining us today Matt Morris, Matt is the Deputy Director of the Development Policy Centre at the Australian National University. Michael Carnahan. Michael is the newly appointed Chief Economist with AusAid. And Truman Packard. Truman is a Sector Coordinator for Human Development at the World Bank in Papua New Guinea, Timor-Leste and the Pacific Islands. I'd like to start today by trying to define what the purpose of aid is and what do we mean when we talk about development aid. Matt Morris, start with you. What, what is aid and what do we mean by development aid? I think one of the things to be quite clear on is often poverty reduction is used as to describe an objective for aid, but poverty reduction can mean many different things to different people. So when we're evaluating the effectiveness of aid programs, we need to be clear on what kind of poverty reduction objective we're talking about. Are we talking about lifting numbers of people out of absolute poverty, the, the one billion people number which Bronwyn mentioned? Are we talking about broader dimensions of poverty such as ensuring access to health, education or even civil rights? Are we talking about the, the, the poorest of the, of the poor, the people who are at least likely to escape from poverty without external assistance? And are we talking about um, lifting current numbers of people out of poverty or increasing the capacity of governments or recipients of aid to have a more self-sustaining development process which will lift people out of poverty in the future. It's very important to be clear on the objectives of poverty reduction and aid. Mm. Matt, there are still substantial numbers of people in poverty in the world today despite huge inflows of aid. Does that mean that aid doesn't work? I think the, the data shows that there have been very significant reductions in the number of people living in poverty. I think the number was about 1.9 billion in 1990. Um, the last World Bank estimate for 2008, I think, was 1.3 billion. Um, looking at the proportions of people living in poverty, it's down from about 40-something to 22 percent. So there have been very significant reductions in, in poverty. Um, but that's not necessarily the same as saying that aid has contributed to that reduction in poverty. When we look at the evidence on aid, um, there's a variety of techniques for looking at whether it's effective or not. One is to look at across countries as to whether aid has had an impact on the, the economic growth rates in countries. And here the evidence is actually quite inconclusive. It doesn't show a, a strong relationship between aid encouraging faster growth in, in developing countries. On the other hand, there's a lot of evidence from project level evaluations which shows that aid is effective in terms of delivering its objectives. Um, but even with those evaluations, a lot of the, the, the methodologies could be much stronger. So I guess the, 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 the quality of that evidence base um, on aid could be a lot stronger. Mm. So clearly, aid needs to be effective. What does effective aid look like? How do we know what an effective aid program is? I think. A useful question to, to ask is how to improve the, the, the quality of aid. What are the kind of things which can be done to make aid work better? Um, one of the key determinants of the, the quality of aid 
is the, the quality of the recipient of the aid. Obviously, a, a country or a recipient who has very good poverty reduction programs, good systems for spending the money, is going to make better use of aid than, say, a country or a partner which has relatively less good policies and institutions. So that's a key determinant there. The second is looking at the interrelationship between the, the people giving the aid and the recipient. There's a lot of waste um, in the international aid system in terms of the numbers of, of donors all vying for attention of recipient countries. The kind of the classic example is the, the hundreds of donor missions going through countries each year all vying for some of the time of a finance minister. So a finance minister's job becomes dealing with donor representatives rather than being a, a finance minister per se. So there's a lot of things which can be done to reduce the amount of duplication and waste within the aid system. And finally, there's a, a range of things which can be done by, by donor agencies themselves to improve the, the, the way in which they work. This could include things like being more selective in terms of where aid is given so that resources um, are not spread too thinly. Um, it can include being more transparent about how aid is being spent so that both taxpayers and the sending country know how their aid money is being spent, but also the recipients of aid know what money they should be receiving. And also there are things which can be done in terms of improving the evidence, as I said, the evidence in terms of what kind of aid interventions work and why um, could be improved considerably. In fact, a lot of what is, is done in aid is, is more guesswork than science, and so using more scientific and more rigorous evaluation methodologies to improve the, the quality of aid interventions is another important thing that donors can do. So how close is the sector towards achieving this ideal and, and what can be done to get closer to, to those ideals of, of aid effectiveness? I think when we look at the, the, the various international fora which have taken place on aid effectiveness, we find that there's quite a lot of consensus around some of the key ingredients to, to making aid work better, particularly around things like reducing duplication and waste. Um, one of the problems, though, is when we actually look at the, the practical action on the ground, there's a gap between the, the rhetoric of, 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 of donor countries and what they actually do on the, on the ground. So you know, reducing the proliferation of projects is, is one of the things which has been agreed to. But over the, the last five or six years, there's been a proliferation increase in the number of projects and the fragmentation of aid. So there's increasing attention looking at the, the broader political economy around aid and how to improve the incentives for the, the, the donor agencies in terms of how they, they deliver aid to accelerate the progress on what we know needs to be done to improve aid effectiveness. Okay. Turn to Truman Packard now. Truman, the World Bank has one of the longest standing aid programs in the world. What does development effectiveness mean for the World Bank? We're very uncontroversial in how we define development and development effectiveness. Development for us is uh, more women surviving childbirth, um, fewer kids dying of preventable diseases, more kids going to school, more kids completing school, especially uh, young girls, um, sustained growth and job creation. Um, where we're a little bit different from the rest of the development industry is that we have high expectations of our clients. We're an international non-profit development cooperative providing a whole range of services. We have shareholders and we have clients. We're neither a charity nor a donor. And because of that, our expectation for our clients and how we can make aid effective is that they step up, that they show ownership and leadership, and that they determine and lead us in the direction in, in which they want to go toward those, toward those goals of more women surviving childbirth, fewer kids dying of preventable diseases. And how does that increase the effectiveness of your aid when, when you're looking for the, these, these partners, these clients to cooperate with you? Why does that make it more effective? I think it, it makes a big difference in that, um, you know, people treat money that's given to them as a gift differently from the money that they earn. Um, they treat it more, uh, they treat money that they earn more seriously, more carefully, with greater scrutiny demanding greater accountability. And our financial assistance, with the, which is just a small segment of all the forms of assistance that we give, 
um, is structured in order to try to um, and try to try to provoke that sense of ownership so that the relationship is one of a development services provider and providing services to a client rather than one of a donor and a recipient of charity. Uh, finding these people is always difficult, but finding them is critical to success and using them as a beachhead or an entry point <coughs> to provoke sufficient systemic reforms so that you can catalyze the process of development. Mm. Truman, what's the World Bank's approach when you find a situation where there are people in need in a country, but you can't find that beachhead, you can't find that partner to work with? And in those cases, the partners that we have to make are uh, the broader, the partners that are in the broader development community, particularly those that are charged with the responsibility of first response in the case of disasters, or first response in the case of failed states. Um, they are the critical first wave of contact um, in order to provide the necessary support. But that, to me, is more coping. That's not development. Um, development is a long-term process that requires those people on the other side of the table being active clients and the owners of development. What about the role of civil society? Is that valuable as well? Civil society is, is key, um, both in terms of the, the coping stages of dealing with failed states, but also uh, in the long-term process of development. Civil society, and more importantly, uh, the sense of civic responsibility that every citizen um, should feel is a key, uh, a key element in that informed, sorry, citizens who feel like they own the process of development and who feel a civic responsibility are more likely to hold their leaders to account. They're more likely to demand that uh, development to dollars, whether donated or borrowed, are used in their most effective way. Matt, what do you think? Is this, is this an, a, a way to ensure aid is effective, this approach of finding partners within a country to work with? I think all aid donors would like to find partners in recipient countries who you know, demonstrate ownership, have clear policies and programs, um, and, are, uh, and are good recipients of aid. I think the challenge is that um, a lot of poor people don't live in countries. Um, which have those kind of levels of, of governance, um, which is why we talk about you know, failed states or failing states, fragile states, um, countries emerging from conflict. I think we need to, to be sort of practical that we need to have a range of approaches for dealing with different kinds of recipients of aid. The ideal is obviously to have strong partners to work with, but we need to have the other ways of working, perhaps direct service delivery um, to ameliorate the impacts of, of poverty for countries where they're not yet ready, the government, to, to be a, 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 a partner that we'd like them to be. Mm. Michael Carnahan, what do you think the key is to the delivery of, of aid effectively? So it's interesting you mentioned big numbers like $8 billion, $9 mm. billion. Dollars. Um, in terms of lifting a billion people out of poverty, those aren't very big numbers. Mm. And for me, Effective aid programs are ones that actually leverage our aid money to much bigger results than the direct spending does itself. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, in Indonesia, we're working with the Indonesian government uh, in their social protection area. And we're only putting in about 5% of the funding into the social protection program going forward. But what we want to do is help them deliver a much more effective social protection program so that the poorest of the poor uh, the ones who aren't benefiting from the 6.5% growth in Indonesia, they are still being looked after, they're being brought out of poverty. So there's one example, that if we can use our, our money to make that program more effective, we can lead to a much bigger impact than the money itself. The other sorts of things, uh, there's a question about the role of the private sector in, uh, in growth and development leading people out of poverty. One of the challenges, including the Pacific, is uh, getting the right sorts of insurance coverage, getting access to finance. If we can work with development <coughs> partners such as some of the World Bank to make a small investment that they can then leverage into a much larger amount of private sector finance, then we can start to have a real impact. So effective aid is about um, how do you get, how do you use your money to catalyse much more impact than the money directly has in and of itself. Because, I mean, frankly, when you add up the ODA being the, the development assistance being spent around the world, it's actually not very much money given the scale of poverty in the region. 
And picking up Matt's point about the uh, poverty, there's been tremendous progress uh, in the last 15 years lifting people out of poverty, um, but we've got the easy people out of poverty. The next billion is going to be much harder. That's the people who have multiple and complex entrenched disadvantage. Um, you know, there are people who are, who are poor who have come out because they've got some education or had an opportunity. The last billion will, be, will require much more work, and that's where the aid effectiveness becomes much more critical. Um, and I guess the last point, and this is, uh, I think Matt made some great points about uh, the challenge between rhetoric versus reality and uh, many commitments that get made by donors collectively and how they get translated. And it's really important that the pressure stays on to translate those commitments into action. But what we see is there's always going to be a gap between rhetoric and reality. But what's happened over the last 10 or 20 years is the rhetoric has actually dragged the reality forward. So some of the tools that we're using now that we think are passe, like multi-donor trust fund arrangements to coordinate donor activity, that, you know, 20 years ago, they were much less used. Um, the idea of joint assessment missions where donors go in together or work in a sector together um, were not used 20 years ago in the same way they are now. So I agree there's more to be done and it's important that the rhetoric continues to move forward, but the reality does follow. Not not never catches up, but it moves in lockstep and we do see the increased effectiveness. We're doing the sorts of things we wanted to do 10 years ago. That's much better than not doing them. And in 10 years' time, we're doing the sorts of things that we're talking about now. It will take time, but this is a long game. Mm. In recent years, there's been some critique of development aid as a means of poverty reduction. For example, author and <coughs> economist Dambisa Moyo has argued that aid doesn't work, that despite more than receiving more than $1 trillion from the West over the last half century. Africa, for example, remains in dire economic straits. She argues that aid crowds out private sector development and that it's just easy money that enables the elites to embezzle public revenues. Matt Morris, what do you think of this critique? I think, I mean, the, the book had the potential to be a, a very important contribution to the debate on aid effectiveness. Um, Dambisi Moyo is from Zambia. Um, she's got degrees from Harvard, Oxford, worked for the World Bank and investment banks. But in terms of uh, the argument that she puts forward, she's very selective in terms of the evidence she chooses to, to recognize. So you know, the three main parts to her argument, that one, that aid doesn't work, two, that aid has a negative with bad effects, and three, that there's other things as alternatives to aid. I mean, on the first one, as I said, the evidence um, on the impact of aid on, on growth, as I said, is, is inconclusive and, and she cites that, but ignores a lot of the evidence which shows that specific aid projects and interventions do have significant impacts on, on poverty. On the, the, the question of whether aid has negative effects um, on countries, so this is the idea that perhaps it causes more corruption or it leads to, to fungibility. Um, again, the evidence on this is, is inconclusive. I think these are the kind of issues that all aid donors need to be mindful of in the, in the design of, of, of country programs, but it's not clear that there is strong evidence showing that aid is, is causing these things. A final point that really we should be talking about trade and private finance as alternatives to aid. I think you know, what we've seen with the, the global financial crisis and the impact that that had on trade and, and financial flows really underscores that the, the official development assistance flows really complement those other forms of, of financial flows, particularly in times when there's um, upheavals in the, in the global economy. So I think her argument really falls short in a, in a quite a, uh, in a large way, really. While well, agreeing with, um, with Matt that much of the arguments in her, in her writings are inflammatory, one of the arguments that I have a lot of sympathy for is the one that countries uh, would be better off borrowing from private markets for many of the things for which they are receiving aid. I have a lot of sympathy for that. Uh, again, as I said in my introductory remarks, people treat the money they earn and the debt that they take out there themselves very differently from windfalls that they receive from the lottery or from uh, a rich grandma who just died. That money is treated differently. And in functioning uh, democracies or even ones that, that function at the bare minimum, more attention is paid by citizens 
to the debt that countries take out that's considered hard money rather than soft money. Um, it's treated a little bit more seriously. Um, and where there are instances of aid crowding out that channel of finance, I absolutely agree that um, that aid is doing more harm than, 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 than good. But this term aid is used to uh, describe all sorts of assistance. Part of it is financial. Much of it is knowledge. Part, just a very small part of aid is financial transfers. Most of it is knowledge transfers. And the knowledge transfers that happen in terms of the knowledge of setting up a, uh, a good governance, setting up uh, the kind of institutions that uh, will uh, enable a private sector to function are the ones that can help countries to access private markets, those countries that aren't able to access um, them currently. I wanted to look now at the independent review of aid effectiveness and the government response, which both came out last year. Michael Carnahan, the review called Australia's aid program improvable but good. What do you think were its most important findings? So I'll focus on um, the finding that I think was, was most important, and that's built, I guess, partly from my own experience working in the field in developing countries. Um, the finding around the predictability of aid flows, to me, is the most critical one. Um, and that's because, I'll tell you a story why I think that. I'm sitting, in, I'm sitting in Kabul and we're trying to do an investment plan for infrastructure, both social and physical infrastructure, and with the degree of decay that has occurred in that country over uh, you know, a number of years, this is 2002, 2003, there are amazing needs to be met. And what you uh, need to do is you say, well, what's, we can't fix this in a year or two years. You need a 10 or 20 year investment plan to do this. And we had an advisor provided by, uh, actually by the US government who had been, previously had run a major international airline. So an amazing corporate businessman, very wise, and he said, I don't work with, more, with less than 25 years. That's my time horizon. And I said, well, we don't have kind of 25 months of information about the aid that we're going to get. So we plan with what we have. And it's incredibly difficult. And so for me, both in the, in the review and then the government's response to increase the predictability around Australia government uh, aid flows is, again, from my perspective, the single biggest uh, contribution. So looking at a rolling four-year commitment that indicates where we'll be do working and what we'll be working on uh, will have the biggest impact on, uh, on effectively delivering assistance because it's that degree of certainty that the recipient countries need to start planning uh, because ultimately, as Matt said, without good partners in the recipient countries, we won't be effective. And if they don't have the certainty that they can start planning in the longer term, they can't plan effectively, we can't partner effectively. So there are many other, I think, really interesting findings, very interesting responses, but for me it's that predictability that is really the, is the key finding and the key response. Matt, just briefly, what do you think are the, the most important findings to come out of the review? I think the, the point that Michael said on predictability is a, a very important one. I think it's also very encouraging that so many of the recommendations from the review have been taken up by the, the government, a particular one on the transparency and making more information available. Um, AusAid's taken huge strides over the last year or so on that one. I think one area which perhaps needs more attention is around evaluation. Um, in scaling up aid, it's incredibly important to understand what kind of aid projects work and why, so that we scale up programs which work um, and we don't scale up programs which perhaps aren't having a, an impact. It also means that, you know, identifying sort of new things which perhaps we're not doing at the moment, which can be, can be scaled up. And I think in that regard, there's still quite some way for, for AusAid to go in terms of um, improving the, the, the quality and the rigor of the, the evaluations and making them public so that those evaluations can be critiqued um, by either people on the ground in the countries um, or by, by taxpayers here. I think that's a, a key one which AusAid needs to focus on over the next year or so. Mm. Michael, how is AusAid going to make sure its increasing budget is used effectively and wisely? I mean, there are, there are a range of different ways and there are all, a lot of those are covered off in the, in the government's response. Uh, 
much you know, increased focus on you know, fraud. The transparency point that uh, Matt made is, is absolutely critical. We're moving forward on that. Uh, seven or eight countries, uh, details of the programs are on the website now, looking to increase that to all the countries going forward. Uh, the issue of the independent evaluation committee under consideration, they'll be, you know, we're moving forward on that recommendation. Obviously, details still to be finalised. Um, there are ongoing reviews. I mean, the government itself, at, at the cabinet level, much more interest is, you know, showing a real appetite for what's being delivered. We're reporting annually back to cabinet. So this rolling review of the uh, program will continue. Uh, the multilateral assessment, I think we, we can talk a little about, making sure that when we provide MATE to multilateral institutions, we give it to the ones that are going to be delivering effectively. Um, and our review did, did highlight that. Uh, but I mean, again, the, I mean, and even at the basic level, the sorts of internal you know, workforce planning that AusAid is doing now, taking into account the fact that it's a growing organisation to meet a growing uh, aid budget, uh, comprehensive workforce planning to make sure that we've got the skills and capabilities to deliver the program effectively. Um, we talk about capability building in our partner governments. We've got to build our capability to do that. And it's a process and we've made a lot of progress. But uh, in the words of the uh, aid review, good but improvable. Uh, made some progress, lots more still to be done. Okay. All right, I think we're ready to move to some questions now. Uh, is there anyone in Sydney who would like to ask a question? Uh, my name is Fiona Ryan. I'm just an independent uh, scholar. And uh, I was involved in aid in the 90s. And the big thing then in the academic community was the projects were too big. And we hit a bit, bit today about stopping the proliferation of projects, which means bigger projects, I assume, because um, if you have bigger projects, then you know they're not going to suit the individual conditions on the ground, because it never quite works out the way you, when you actually do a project, it never quite works out the way you planned. So I was just wondering, how does that flexibility that comes with small projects um, compete with the bigger project scenario that administrators prefer? I think we have to be really, I mean there's a lot of imprecision in uh, the development industry about what we mean by different words and what does a project mean. But you can have a, and a lot of it is about how do we manage effectively the resources at our disposal to deliver the results that we're trying to deliver. So you could have a, you can have a, a large Pro, a, a, you know, a multi hundreds of millions of dollar project that is managed in quite a uh, diffuse way. So you can umbrella a community, a community driven development program. Uh, you can have that that's quite tailored to local circumstances, but is administered in uh, quite, you know, with, with uh, quite a central administration, but with cap capability to have meeting the individual circumstances at the local level. So I think a I think there's a distinction between a big project which is a one-size-fits-all uh, versus a big project which has the flexibility with local implementing partners to have the, if the sort of economies of scale and the centralised administration but the flexibility at the local level. So I think we need to be, yeah, clearly in the 90s there were big projects which just said you will all have a well in your village. Uh, whether you've got one or not, whether you need one or not, we're here to build wells and we're going to build 100,000 wells across this country versus a block grant type program that says you will get, uh, you know, your village will get you know, $20,000 and your village development council has to decide what is the best thing for your village. You can have the same administrative architecture, but that local demand and local need can be met in that sort of project. Truman, did you want to add anything to that? Yes, I, well, I think that the, the, the focus on results which is common in AUSAID, it's common in DFID, it's common in the World Bank, is very, very helpful along these lines in that um, sort of coming to an agreement with clients and partners about the, what are the development results that you want to see um, becomes a very substantive discussion about outcomes. And then how you get there can be a, 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 a an opportunity to exercise a lot of flexibility, a lot of uh, bespoke tailoring to the particular circumstances in a country, to the particular circumstances uh, in a province. Uh, one community might uh, try to tackle its problem of low levels of uh, school enrollment differently from another community, depending on what they see as the challenges that are are, there, are theirs and very particular to their circumstances. So I think that the focus on results is a helpful one, 
that will eventually shift much more of development into uh, a manner that will be much more sensitive and, and much more effective given particular circumstances on the ground. Okay. Man? Yeah, I think an another point to sort of note on this is this the issue on, on transaction costs. Um, you know, if we say have a, the education sector where we have lots of different donors with separate projects all trying to tailor um, their projects to, to the recipient, um, it's a recipe for quite a lot of confusion and, and, and discoordination. So some of the, the move to bigger projects is things like the, the multi-donor trust funds, which is basically pooling those resources. So trying to be responsive and, and tailoring, but doing so in a, in a coordinated kind of way. Um, that's the kind of the, the sector-wide approach, I guess. Um, you know, the other one which gets talked about a lot is is using partner country systems. So at the extreme, this could be providing budgetary support or uh, uh, money directly into the, the recipient government's um, budget. From a donor perspective, that's one, one project. But in insofar as it's funding lots of different activities within the, the recipient government's budget, it's enabling local actors to identify what those priorities are and to fully fund them. I'm not saying that's the, the, the most appropriate approach in all circumstances, but these are a range of ways in which the, the balance between responsiveness um, and getting some economies of scale can be managed. Okay. I've got a couple of questions from our international audience here from the Solomon Islands. I have a question from uh, Ella Kohwe. I'm sorry, Ella, I'm sure I've mispronounced your surname. Ella is with the Solomon Islands National Council of Women and she has a question for Michael or Truman. What is effective aid in the Solomon Islands given 64% of women in this country continue to experience gender violence and have not seen or felt the effectiveness of aid? You know, that's... It. It's a very timely question. Two weeks ago or three weeks ago, we had uh, our gender specialist, our lead gender spe specialist, Andy Mason, presenting the World Development Report 2012, which is on gender and equity and development. Um, and, and I think he did stop off in the Solomon Islands and, and, and the, the received a lot of coverage. Um, gender is now being mainstreamed throughout our institution. Um, what does that mean? It means that we, uh, all of our reporting on results um, is going to be disaggregated between uh, girls and boys, women uh, and men. Uh, we have lots of programs that are aimed at increasing the attendance of girls at school, keeping them in school so that they complete uh, minimum basic levels of training. We have uh, programs through our private sector investment arm, the IFC, that look at access to credit, particularly of businesses, small businesses that are headed by women. Um, it's a big agenda. It's a very big agenda. And this corner of the world probably suffers gender disparities like no other. So, um, you know, it's something that we're working on. It's now a flagship part of our program, and it's one in which we hope to see much more progress. Look, I mean, I think this is, uh, this is a really difficult and very tragic issue. Um, and we need to be mindful of, at some level, the little we can do and the, the great we can do. Uh, and we need to think about both the here and now, but also the systemic issues that underpin uh, why you have such high levels of gender violence. And some of, I mean, as uh, like Truman said, we're looking at how we mainstream the gender issues into every program. So we see how do these programs actually empower and support women and girls. So focus has girls' education, girls' and women's access to healthcare become critical indicators for success for us. Um, one area we're also working specifically is on in the economic empowerment area. Um, there's uh, you know there's strong evidence about uh, the you know the multiple positive benefits of greater female participation in uh, both entrepreneurial and in the labour force more generally. And the spin-off benefits to that more broadly in society are well documented. So we've got specific programs de being developed in that area, looking at how do we you know, increase women's access, in, women's access to the economy. And uh, as I said, that's a longer term issue. Uh, 
and there are things we can do you know, in, in the shorter term. Uh, some of the things I think Andy Mason was picking up in that regard. But it's a, it's a hard and long issue. Uh, but I do think there are benefits. There are benefits flowing from the aid program. They, and as I said, there could be more, and we're looking at both the short term and the long term, how to address that. Okay. I have another question from the Solomon Islands for Michael again. Uh, it's from Sharifu, who is the UNDP advisor to the Ministry of Planning and Aid Coordination. How can aid contribute to small and medium enterprises and private sector development in countries like the Solomon Islands? So, I won't give a long answer to this because I could give a very long answer to this. <laughs> There are multiple different channels that aid can, be, that aid can uh, be used through for private sector development in small countries like the Solomon Islands. Uh, there are things like providing access to finance. So, as I said, using institutions that can leverage a small aid contribution into a significant, uh, significantly bigger access to finance for small and medium enterprises. Uh, there's the sorts of services that people like the IFC and others provide in terms of business advisory services. Uh, so they set up a shop and they actually help small and medium enterprises to uh, you know, get their business up and running. Uh, there's economic reforms that support a better business environment that uh, mean that businesses can, cannot flourish. So helping countries, you know, there's a World Bank ease of doing business survey that's done across the globe. Looking at the sorts of things that make business easier to do and supporting the Solomon Islands government in, uh, in doing those things. Uh, but partly it's about, it's about training the people, it's about thinking about some access to market issues, um, but a lot of it really comes down to, you know, it's a long game, how do we build the basic human capital, the capabilities of the people, so that they can, they can uh, you know, it's not that they're not smart, they know how to make a buck, but they need to, you, know, you need to have the, the workers there and the access to markets to be able to do that, but it's a, it's a multi-pronged approach. Thanks, Michael. Uh, now, do we have any questions from our Sydney audience? Yeah, we have lots of hands up. Thanks. So, I'm Tim Jordan and I work in finance here in Sydney. Um, so Darren Asamoglu's new book, uh, Why Nations Fail, makes the case, I think quite persuasively, that uh, institutions are the key to growth in the long run. And he argues that, that, that inclusive institutions are better than extractive ones. But when we look at uh, the capacity of development institutions to influence institutions in, in developing countries, it's very limited. So the World Bank's, the, the IDA is prevented from engaging in the, in, in, in intervening in the domestic politics of any, of, of a country donor. I wonder, isn't there an obligation on, on development institutions to at least remind countries that, that democracy and inclusive institutions are in the long run the key to, uh, to, to development and growth? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with all those arguments, and I also agree that we have a responsibility to do so, but I agree that we have a responsibility to, to do so behind closed doors. Um, I think in, that's what sets our role apart. Uh, we have to, in order for us to remain effective as a multilateral development cooperative, uh, we have to have the confidence of our clients that we are putting their interests and their development first. So we can't be seen to be advocates, or at least advocates for the sake of advocacy. Um, we have to be seen as advocates for the sake of their eventual prosperity, even if that sometimes means doing business um, with questionable partners, but sending these difficult messages behind closed doors, winning the confidence of a sustained long-term relationship of a provider of development assistance that doesn't have a political agenda other than the prosperity of that country. Once we gain that confidence, it's easier for us to, to make those difficult arguments and send those difficult messages. Okay, Matt, I think you had something to say. Yeah, I think you've highlighted uh, a really important issue on you know, the importance of, of institutions. I think you know, a lot of what's been learned over 50 years of aid giving is the importance of institutions. I think when it comes to actually contributing to improving the quality of institutions, the, the, the track record um, has, has been less, less successful. And I think we're, we're still sort of, as, a, as an aid community, trying to work out what are the best ways um, of, of doing that. But at the same time, I think there's some interesting developments um, in terms of um, the way that governments are interacting with their own citizens which are fundamentally changing the, the whole dynamic. Um, we've seen massive rise of, of social media, um, of mobile phones and the like, 
um, which fundamentally transform the, the relationship. So we've got Papua New Guinea um, on, online here today would know that recently there's been a big debate in Papua New Guinea about um, government plans to defer the elections um, and a response through social media to organize um, a, a large-scale protest which then has a, an impact on the, on the government in terms of its decision making. Um, you know, th these are the kind of changes which are, are taking place which perhaps going to be um, more durable and have a bigger impact in the, in, the, in the longer term than perhaps aid is the instrument for doing that. And perhaps aid's role is to augment some of those things by putting more information out into the public domain which some of the advocacy groups and, and, and citizens can respond to um, and hold their governments to account. So perhaps it's a, a less direct way um, of going about this than perhaps we've done in the past. Michael? Just, uh, just a couple of quick follow-up points. I, I mean, I agree with Truman. Having sat in rooms uh, with the Afghan and Timorese government and seen the World Bank and the IMF come in and uh, you know, deliver a series of uh, suggestions on the sorts of policies that will be more inclusive and support more inclusive growth, um, whilst they obviously stick to their charter, they can be very effective advocates in that sort of situation. And the fact that it doesn't get broad coverage is uh, probably a good thing rather than a bad thing. The other thing is, when we talk about inclusive institutions, I think an area where we have struggled over the uh, past 30 years is that we've often focused at the front end in, in terms of the policy, like how do we get a good policy? Uh, you know, and, and we could have a great policy, picking up the Solomon Islands point, we could have a great policy that says it is illegal to uh, engage in gender violence. And we would all clap ourselves on the back and think, haven't we made a great contribution to uh, the women of the Solomon Islands and the people who support them? But if we don't actually have a police force that will arrest somebody for undertaking an act of uh, gender violence, a court system filled with low-level functionaries in the court system who will actually follow that law and prosecute that case, and then a prison system that can imprison people. These are all low paying jobs, but it's that capability, it's, it's, not just, it's the capability to enforce the laws as much as the capability to pass the laws that will determine the success. And again, that's a long game about human capability development, but you don't pass laws you can't enforce, and that's an area I think we need to think on some more. Okay, another question from Sydney. Hi, my name's Martin Thomas, I'm with World Vision. Um, questions for Michael, I know you touched on it, but um, the ability of Oslo to, to spend the extra money in the aid budget between now and 2015, um, how much of a challenge is it? Is it something that keeps you up at night or will it be a dawdle? And second question to that, it seems that those that are talking about cutting the aid budget in terms of political leaders seem to cite this as one of the key issues. Uh, what can be done to convince people if it, uh, if it is achievable? Oh, so uh, a, uh, a glib answer to start with, it's easy to spend the money, it's hard to spend it well. And that's the, uh, that's the challenge. I think the, the important thing for us, and this is what we're focusing on building our internal capabilities, where the critiquing and the uh, external vigilance becomes most important to us, is making sure that we spend it effectively. Um, and, and again, picking up Matt's point, it's actually, if we want to put $8 billion into Indonesia, it's actually pretty easy. And, we could, and it would be really effective. I mean, you could just expand a bunch of programs there, and you could do a lot of really very good things. Um, spending money in areas where the, uh, the state apparatus is not as strong will be harder. And we'll have to look at ways, you know, when we spend more money, we'll have to look at how we do risk management differently. Um, as you put more money in, you know, there are going to be more risks. We have to make sure we're very aggressive on corruption and fraud because with more money you will see more cases like that. So we need to have structures to manage it. Um, yeah, I think we can spend it effectively. I just don't think it's going to be easy. Okay. Did you want to add something, Matt? Yeah, just to come back to I mean, I think the, the, the key point is, you know, if we, if we just continue with a kind of a business as usual approach, scaling up with the business as usual is going to be incredibly difficult because yeah. staff resources within Auslead are already incredibly stretched. So in terms of scaling up, we need to find new ways of, of, of spending aid money rather than just replicating what's, what's already happening. One is you know, you know, big infrastructure projects or things like that in, in Indonesia would be one way to, to, to spend large amounts of aid. Another would be to identify... Um, aid donors or NGOs which have very good track records 
on delivering aid and who are delivering aid in parts of the world where we know there are large numbers of, of poor people living, and then to put aid money through those organizations. That eases the administrative burden on, on AusAid, but by putting it through um, well-managed and, and good delivery channels, we can be confident that it is having the impact. Michael, you had something? Just a very short addition. Mm. The importance of, this is why the importance of the multilateral uh, assessment was so critical, because we needed to know as we scale up uh, our aid program that we can have faith and confidence in our multilateral partners and we found that 90% uh, of the money we put through them is through partners that are working effectively and we can look to scale up to the ones that are working effectively. Okay. I've got a question now from Dili from Olivio Dos Santos who's the program assistant at the World Bank Dili office. It's a question for Michael. Uh, many of the countries to which AusAid contributes aid in the Pacific region are fragile or conflict affected. How is the design and implementation of Australian aid adapted to these countries' differing situations, despite lack of human resources and capacity to manage aid and lack of ownership? So the, uh, the short answer to that is it's much more difficult. And I would say that when you're thinking about aid effectiveness, it's kind of like a diving competition. You know, the degree of difficulty in some countries is pretty low, but the degree of difficulty in working in some fragile and conflict-assisted countries is much higher. Um, you need to work with what you've got. Um, you need to tailor your programs that are mindful of the human resources capability. And it's in that area that the sorts of things like stronger donor coordination become absolutely critical. Um, you, know, you think to yourself, if we've got 100 or 200 or 500 really great administrators in this country, where should they be? Um, should they be working in uh, you know, donors and multilateral institutions or should they be working in the, in the uh, Timorese government? I think there's a lot of complex issues in that space that we need to think through um, because it, it is, we, we must do simpler programs, um, we must communicate them much better and really a lot of it is making sure that we are building on an ongoing and rapid basis the capability of the people in the country to take those programs over and be supporting them rather than having them support us in the programs. Okay, thank you. I have a question, another question from Ella from the Solomon Islands National Council of Women. It's a question for Truman. How can we have aid effectiveness in a country like the Solomon Islands where there is ongoing corruption, systems are not transparent and accountable, and local capacity is thin? You know, <clears throat> since taking up this job nine months ago, I've been reminded continuously of what in the uh, debate on education reform in the United States was called the tragedy of low expectations. And the, way, the reason that I'm reminded of it is because there's been a constant refrain amongst colleagues and partners about, oh, the low capacity of the governments and we have to be careful not to unburden them with too much complexity and not to try to expect too much. But I think that that's a tragedy in that it, it, it sort of uh, creates low expectations and therefore people don't perform to their best. Now, in cases of I think that that can be reversed to the relationship between governments and their citizens. There's also a tragedy of low expectations. Citizens are expecting too little from their governments, too little by way of accountability, too little by way of service provision. And if you think of the, the, the key defining feature that sets developing country contexts from uh, developed country contexts, it's that in the developed country contexts, citizens are very, very clear that the government is there to service them. And they hold their governments to very high expectations for level of performance. Now, aid, whether it comes in the form of money or whether it comes in the form of, of knowledge, can only do so much in order to try to reform institutions and shed greater light and bring greater transparency. transparency. Ultimately, Citizens have to feel empowered and citizens have to break this tragedy of low expectations and expect much more performance from, those, uh, from their governments. That's what we've seen in the Arab world in the past year. And look at the revolutions that that has brought about. Okay, thank you. We've got time for a few more questions in our Sydney audience. Les Kippa, um, Director of the Institute for Economics and Peace uh, here in Sydney. Uh, my question r relates back to the one that we got from Dili. Um, fragile states. We know that fragile states are those who have made the least progress towards achieving the MDGs. 
And some of those states have now uh, gotten together under the umbrella of the G7 Plus to be at the table with the donor countries to discuss together what aid should look like in those countries and what the goals that it should try and achieve um, are. I'm, I'm curious uh, on the thoughts of the panel on uh, really this phenomenon of the G7 plus uh, countries and the so-called New Deal um, for um, engagement in fragile states. Thank you. Well, look, I think, um, I think it's a tremendous, I think the G7 plus is a tremendous addition to the dialogue. Uh, I think, and it picks up points that both Matt and Truman have said, the most important thing to getting effective aid is the recipient country's capability to use that aid effectively. And the G7 Plus, I think, is a welcome contribution of saying, of having the recipients saying with their collective voice, these are the things that are important to us. These are the, you know, and so it is things like predictability and transparency. And I think it gives a tremendous, you know, impetus to many of the things that aid agencies actually want to do. Now they can, now they, now they can do it more easily. The G7 Plus is a, you know, is it, it's a, it's a really welcome addition because you need that voice coming through. Uh, from a, I mean, on the one hand, the, uh, one of the challenges that you find when you're in an aid agency is you get criticised you know, for having uh, all this disparate approach. But when you go into a country, you often get a disparate response from the recipient government. Mm. But having this, uh, this focused, these are the things that are really important to us, uh, that focus and prioritisation is a, it's a great way forward. I think it's uh, the sort of thing that can make a real contribution. OK. We have another question here, do we? Nathan Verrall, okay. University of Sydney. Um, thank you very much for a very insightful and interesting discussion. Um, when we look at um, Africa, China has had a very different approach to development. Um, as, as you know, Af Africa has been changing over the last decade, and McKinsey recently described Africa as lines on the move because of all the changes that, that have been happening there. So there, China's approach to Africa is, uh, to their development, is, uh, is, is, is not about aid and development. Is as Mr. Matt Morris just explained, it's more about trade and investment, about developing the private sector. Um, it's about more of an equal partnership, a sort of a win-win situation, a fully disclosed and a transparent transaction. So they have like a contract and they say, this is what we give you and this is what we would like. And I think people like that. They don't really want aid. They would like, from, from what, what I've seen in my work over the last five years with some really interesting and some really important infrastructure in Africa, and it's really through China, is, you know, they want to feel empowered and they want to have a power over the choice in their developments. Um, that people don't want just to be given money from, 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 from what I've seen in my work. Any comments on that? Beware of strangers bearing gifts. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. Um, uh, people, I think, are fundamentally suspicious of something that is presented as a gift. Um, I think even at the most micro level, there have been even experiments that have shown that uh, with bed nets, I think that was uh, a paper that I read that, you know, when they were given bed nets, uh, the bed nets weren't used. They were being used for like fishing in rivers versus when they were charged a small bit for the bed net, then they were actually used and, and sh uh, greater value was given to them. This brings me back to the, the, the point that I made before. Um, I'm, I'm gr grateful to be a part of an institution that is primarily not about charity. Because um, I think that it, it brings an amount of uh, a, a greater seriousness, a greater amount of attention to uh, the discussion of development assistance in all of its forms, whether it's financial, knowledge, or what have you. I had a wonderful client in, in Chile in one of the first projects I ever did, which was about uh, supporting preschools. And she said, what are you doing with my grand grandchild's money? You know, because she knew, you know, this was a loan. They were going to pay it back. And it meant that she was paying attention to what I was doing and that, you know, communities were paying attention and there was just a much greater seriousness about it and a gr much greater ownership of it. Okay. I think we've got time for one more brief question from Timor Leste from Luta Hamutak. Uh, and it's about civil society organisations. Civil society organisations are monitoring the state budgets, but currently having obstacles in monitoring the external aid since they are not included in the state budget. 
How can donors facilitate civil society organisations uh, to do this crucial role in monitoring government's public spending? This is, uh, this is not a set up question, but I'm delighted to have it. Um, in fact, with our transparency charter, most of our material, including on Timor Leste, is on our website. Uh, and that is a uh, tremendous example that uh, I would encourage all the other donors in East Timor to follow. Um, because we think this is very important. We think that, you know, that the civil side, that the communities more broadly need to understand where the money is and where the money's going. Uh, because it's only when you get that sense of accountability that people really start to, uh, that's, it's that accountability that is central to effectiveness. When people say, where is the money going? Uh, then you start to get the drive for effectiveness. So my understanding is ours is you know, on, that, on our website uh, and hopefully others are doing the same. Okay, any final comments? We're nearly out of time. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right, thank you very much to our panellists for joining us today. Thank you to everyone in Sydney, to, in Papua New Guinea, in Timor-Leste and in the Solomon Islands. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.